Praise God, church. Welcome to Sunday School Television. This program is inspired by the Holy Spirit to minister to the sick and homebound members of society, those who are unable to attend their local church service. Here at Sunday School Television, we give you a glimpse of the Sunday School lesson taught in church from the International Sunday School Lesson Curriculum. We thank God for our members of the clergy, which use their God-given talents, insight, and biblical studies in teaching the lessons. We also thank the various music ministries, which minister through song within each episode. Reverend Dr. Willie Stukes Sr. is the producer. I am your expositor this week, Minister David L. Stukes, former residential pastor of the AME Fellowship at Christ, Eastern Correctional Facility, Westover, Maryland. This program can be seen every Sunday morning in Manhattan on Time Warner Cable, Channel 1997, and Fios Channel 35 at 8.30 a.m. In the Bronx, catch us Saturday morning at 7.30 a.m., Channel 70, and Fios Channel 36. On the West Coast in Oakland and Berkeley, California, we come on at 9 a.m. Sunday mornings on Channel TV 28. Our lesson this week is taken from Unit 3 of the Spring Quarter under the general quarterly theme, The Gift of Faith. The unit theme is Fullness of Faith. Today we will look at the Gospel of Luke as we consider the subject Grateful Faith. Our key verse, our memory verse, is Luke 17, 15, which reads, One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. All right, let us pray. Heavenly Father, in the precious name of Jesus, we ask that you allow this broadcast, Lord God, to go forth and minister to the hearts of your servants, Lord God, those that are not able to get to their local church for whatever the reason may be, Lord God. We ask that you open up our understanding, Lord God, that we may see great things out of your word, Lord God. Continue to mold us and shape us into the people of God that you have called us to be before the foundation of the world. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. <coughs> Grateful faith. Our devotion reading comes out of Colossians 3, 12 through 17. And our background scripture comes from Luke 17, 11 through 19. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, Go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, Were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to them, Rise and go. Your faith has made you well. The gift of faith. Our lesson aim is to tell the story of, grateful, of the grateful Samaritan leper and also to explain how gratitude can be a barometer of one's faith. The lesson outline has two major points. One, ten desperate men, and two, one grateful man. A, an unending ungratefulness. Those who live in Western democracies enjoy standards of living that people of centuries past would scarcely comprehend. By one estimate, those in the, the very bottom 10% of income in America are at the top 30% of income in the world as a whole. Relatively few in such culture lack basic necessities, yet many are dissatisfied. Why is that? Shouldn't people who have so much be happy and content? The religious heritage of ancient Israel linked gladness with thanksgiving. Joy, praise, and gratitude are interconnected. You can see that in the Psalms. Key elements of worship included both rejoicing and giving thanks. And often repeated worship refrain centers on thankfulness. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Psalms 118, verse 1. There's a fuzzy distinction at best between praising God and thanking God, both being at the very heart of worship. Even so, the Bible depicts many ungrateful people. The history of the Exodus could have been that, of a celebration and quick victory march into the promised land. But grumbling, griping, and murmuring made it otherwise. Deuteronomy 1, says, and ye murmured in your tents, and said, Because the Lord hated us, he hath brought us forth out of the land of Egypt to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites 
to destroy us. The dissatisfied heart always wants more, and greediness nullifies gratefulness. Even so, God is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Luke 6.35 reads, But love your enemies, and do good and lend, hoping for nothing again, and your reward shall be great, and ye shall be the children of the highest. For he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. This week's lessons look at a mighty act of kindness bestowed on ten desperate men, of whom only one exhibited gratefulness. As we consider this account, may we search our own hearts to see if greed or gratefulness is our ensign. Leprosy, now known as Hansen's disease, relatively few people today are afflicted with this loathsome, legendary ailment. There are perhaps no more than 300 new cases annually in the U.S. But le leprosy was well known in the ancient world, being described in the records of many cultures. Left unchecked, the disease results in visible le lesions and de deformations. Traditionally, those so afflicted have been forced to live under quarantine conditions, even until modern times. Leprosy was incurable until the advent of antibiotic drug therapies in the 20th century. Leprosy, as described in the Old Testament, probably included a wide range of afflictions of the skin, not just Hansen's disease, as we know it today. Laws concerning lepers are found especially in Leviticus 13, 1-46, and Leviticus 14, 1-32. To be a leper was to be unclean, often permanently. Those so afflicted had to warn others with cries of unclean, unclean, Leviticus 13, 45 and were required to live apart, that's Leviticus 13, 46. Therefore, lepers suffered not only from the illness itself, but also from being ostracized socially. That was the condition of the ten men of this lesson. Lesson background, Samaritans. At least one of the lepers in today's lesson was a Samaritan. Samaritans who lived in central Palestine were distant relatives of first century Jews. There was great animosity between the two groups in Jesus' day. And you can see that in Luke 9, 51 to 53, and John 4, 9, and 8, 48. A type of bitter tribalism that had been fueled by centuries of negative incidents. The Old Testament traces the timeline of these from 2 Kings 17 through Ezra 4 and Nehemiah 4. The period of time between the Old and New Testament saw further antagonism develop. Concerning lepers, the Samaritans followed the re regulations found in Leviticus. This included excluding from regular village life of those so afflicted. The ten disease outcasts of this week's lesson seem to have consisted of both Jews and Samaritans. We can liken this to a homeless camp made up of folks from divergent backgrounds having been thrown together by desperate circumstances. You have ten desperate men. Now, on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samarita, Samaria and Galilee. Jesus and his followers are still on the way to Jerusalem for Passover, Jesus' final Passover. This gospel marks the final trip as beginning in Luke 9, 41. At that time, Jesus had sent messages ahead into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. You can see that in Luke 9, 52 and Luke 9, 53. See the lesson background regarding this animosity. Jesus prefers to minister in places that are open to his message. So he bypassed that particular Samaritan village. He does not avoid Samaria as a whole, however, since the verse before uh, says he is passing along the border between Samaria and Galilee. No geographical features separate the two areas in an obvious way. The distinction is determined by the makeup of the village. With the Jewish villages of Galilee lying to the north of the Samaritan region, the Samaritans, for their part, are centered in Shechem Valley near Mount Gerizim and the surrounding area, roughly 25 miles due north of Jerusalem. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. 
They stood at a distance. We are not told if this particular village is Galilean, which would be Jewish, or Samaritan. Both Jews and Samaritans isolate lepers, so it may be either. The fact that the ten noted to have leprosy stand at a distance is in compliance with the law of Moses that we read in Leviticus 13.46. They, they stay near the village where some of them may have family members who provide food and clothing, but the men do not venture close. Lepers who ignore the expectation of maintaining proper distance might be driven away by having rocks thrown at them from fear of, from fear and loathing. And called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. The physical distance between Jesus and the lepers, perhaps a hundred yards or more, is highlighted by the need for the men to call out in a loud voice to be heard. The author gives the impression that they shout in unison, indicating the plan formulated before Jesus' visit. The ten men therefore seem to have access to the community grapevine of information. Despite the isolation, friends or relatives who provide for them likely have shared stories that they have heard about Jesus as a healer. The preparedness of this band of desperate men indicates that Jesus' arrival at this particular village is expected and eagerly anticipated. Their cry is a simple request for Jesus to have pity. The Greek behind this expression is usually translated, have mercy. And that is the sense here. This is not a plea for a specific action, but a general appeal for favorable attention. This reveals awareness that Jesus is a compassionate master. If he notices the men's plight, then he may extend his healing power to relieve their sufferings. Requests for God's mercy often frequently in the Psalms. In choral music, the phrase Kyrie Elysion, meaning Lord have mercy, is, a famil is familiar. There is a sad irony in this request from these ten men. They have experienced precious little mercy in recent past. They have been excluded from their homes. They likely are targeted targets of jets and taunts by the younger boys of the village. And most of all, they probably believe that God is punishing them in a merciless fashion. Many things can cause a person to become unclean temporarily. You can see examples in Numbers 19, um, verse 11. But since there is no effective cure for leprosy in this day, to be afflicted by this ailment is usually to remain permanently in an unclean status, a life sentence. This is why leprosy is so feared. Its appearance is a life-altering event that usually ends only with death. When he saw them, he said, Go show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed. The simple command, Go show yourself to the priest, is for the purpose of verifying that the men no longer have the signs of leprosy. This task is a responsibility entrusted to the priest under the law of Moses. A positive certification will mean that the ten men will be able to resume their roles in family and village life. There is a bit of drama to this miraculous healing that we, will, that we will overlook if we do not read carefully. The text does not indicate that the ten are healed immediately. Instead, the impression we are given is that healing comes only as the ten with leprosy obey Jesus by beginning to walk away from him to seek out the priest. It is at that point in time the symptoms of leprosy vanish. We assume this means def deformed fingers are made whole and skin lesions disappear. Hair that has become unnaturally white returns to its natural color. And certainly those healed just feel better. They realize their trip to the priest is not a fool's errand, but rather is the first step in reclaiming their normal lives. A simple lesson here is that faith contain that faith results in obedience leads to healing. For the ten individuals of our text, this is physical healing. For us, it may be spiritual healing, a cleansing of our leprous, unclean hearts, when we obediently follow Jesus. Now we have one grateful man. One of the healed men postpones his trip to the priest seeing all symptoms of his leprosy disappear. He makes a U-turn back to Jesus, and he doesn't come quietly. 
His previous cry of unclean, unclean is now replaced with praise in a loud voice. Perhaps the man is praising God for the first time in many years. He recognizes the miracle of healing and now its source. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. For the man to throw himself at Jesus' feet is the posture of worship, appropriate only for worshiping God. You can see Revelation 19, um, verse 10. This is the man's instinctive reaction. He may not understand everything that has just happened, but one thing he does know, this man, Jesus, is God's instrument in causing him to be healed, to be cleansed. The man has been shown mercy. In the midst of starting, in the midst of this startling return of events, the man cleansed of leprosy does the right thing. This man, who has suffered more than most of us can imagine, has not lost his, huma his humanity. His suffering may have caused doubts, but he still believes that God is in control. He knows that God is worthy of worship, praise, and thanksgiving. Verse 16b says, and he was a Samaritan. Here is the surprise twist of the story. The Jews consider the Samaritans to be something like inferior cousins. How can it be that a Samaritan is the only one who understands that God should be praised and Jesus be thanked for the healing. The irony of this is similar to that of Jesus' parable of the Good Samaritan, which you can read in Luke 10, verses 30 through 35, where a Samaritan is the only one who understands what love for one's neighbor truly is. Jesus asks, Were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? And posing the question we see here, Jesus transformed this miracle, this event, into a teaching opportunity. The questions are almost like mathematical story problems. If 10 individuals are healed from leprosy, how many should give thanks and praise to God? What? Only one came back to do so? What has happened to the other nine? Has God's miraculous power failed? And the nine are still unclean, lepers, who have run away in bitter disappointment? No, that is not the case, because everyone present knows that all ten have been cleansed. The nine neglect to give thanks. Another cur curiosity is that the one who did come back is, of all people, a non-Jew, a foreigner. This is a subtle rebuke to the Jews within earshot who assume that they are superior to Samaritans. In the end, relationship with God is dem demonstrated by one's action, not by ancestral connections or lack thereof. See Luke 3, verse 8. We have attitude of ingratitude. Attitudes of ingratitude have a long history. Had the nine who didn't return to Jesus simply learned simply never learned to express gratitude. With, were they so overjoyed at being healed that as they ran to share the news, they forgot to thank Jesus in the process? Did they feel that they were entitled to their healings, given their lengthy suffering? Let us remember, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. 1 Thessalonians 5, 18. Then he said to him, Rise and go. Your faith has made you well. After addressing the onlookers, Jesus turned to the Samaritans himself with the declaration we see here. The man's new life has begun, and he can get up and go about his business, which first entails getting the blessing of the priest. The man is right to give the credit for the healing to God, but Jesus teaches him a lesson as well. It is through his faith that he has been healed. This does not mean that the man had, has had the power to heal himself all along. It does mean that the power of his personal faith in and of itself has brought about the healing. It means rather that his trust in God as demonstrated by his initial act of obedience to seek out the priest is pleasing to God by whose power the leprosy has been van vanquished. Conclusion A healing faith this week's story is not a lesson that any Christian can be healed if he or simply has enough faith. The darker side of such an idea is to believe that any Christian who suffers from illness 
or ailments is lacking in faith. Certainly the lesson is about the importance of faith, but it is much more a lesson about the need for gratefulness whenever God blesses us. Several times in the gospel, Jesus heals people and pronounces their, that their faith has healed them. Examples include the woman with the issue of blood, Luke 8, 43-48, and blind Bartimaeus, Mark 10, 46-52. There is a double meaning for one of the words in these texts. For a term in Greek that is translated has healed is the same word that is translated saved. In verses like John 3.17, For God did not send his own son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Healing and salvation are both signs of being made well or whole. While we might be skeptical of some claims of healing in the church today, there is no need to dismiss them all. Our God is a God of healing, a lesson that Jesus taught repeatedly in his ministry. Miraculous healing is a gift of God. It is not something to be controlled by a human. Certain individuals might be instruments of God healing power, but God is the one from whom healing comes. Although we may never have witnessed it, a miraculous healing of a physical ailment would be easy for us to understand. If a person had visible symptoms of leprosy that suddenly disappeared, then we would conclude that God had acted. But the Bible account of such miracles should push our thoughts beyond that of physical healing. They should push us to understand how our hearts need to be healed. Our hearts have been dis diseased by sin, hardened by selfishness, and broken by loss. Can they ever be made whole? Here is the lesson. The grateful man who had leprosy was healed in more, way, more than body. His heart was made whole as well. That's what the other nine missed. How sad. Healing begins with faith, with trust in God. We begin to heal when we yield our independence and throw ourselves into the arms of our Father. Healing is nurtured when we follow this faith with gratefulness as expressed through praise and thanksgiving. If a, physical, if a physician saves my life through skilled heart surgery, it would be natural to want to thank him or her. How much more should we turn and thank God who heals our hearts and make us whole for eternity? Prayer for the day. O oh God, heal our hearts. Teach us to praise you gratefully, even in the midst of trouble. We pray this in the name of the one who healed the lepers, Jesus our Lord, amen. And in conclusion, our thought to remember is healing begins with faith.